Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're uh, resuming our NP Tail Ideologies course 2019-20, and we're, we'll continue with our concluding topic, that is the twelfth topic, and um, it is Republicanism and Citizenship. We've started it. I'll uh, recap briefly uh, at the point where we ended uh, last time, and we'll go on through the topic today. It will probably take us at least this lecture and possibly another one, and then a worked example after that, very likely. Well, let's recap at where we were. We were in the process of showing how, um, or seeing how, contemporary republicanism has emerged um, in and through severely critical responses to liberalism and the, the uh, radically insoluble conflicts that uh, liberalism cannot resolve. So let's recap where we were last time. In practice, liberalism looks very different from, from the theory that allows us a wide range of individual rights, of choices protected by rights, and liberalism also, on its, on its own self-description, refrains from imposing any substantive theory of, of, uh, of human nature. In practice, of course, things are very different. Liberalism does have a substantive theory of human nature, which is that we are, according to which we are, radical choosers. That is the essence of being human. Well, in practice, of course, liberalism runs into significant problems, even in, and I have argued, as have many others, that these are incoherences. First of all, we're only too familiar with radically insoluble conflicts between positions which seem to have no common ground whatever. In liberalism, the rights of a fetus, for example, are often counterposed to the rights of the mother. An abortion then means the fetus loses its rights when the mothers might be upheld. Or the other way around, the fetus's rights are upheld against those of the mother. That is a result of, of our putting the issue in terms of rights. Similarly, a right to a traditional life is often set against the right to choose another way of life, or against, for example, the right of a contractor to pursue their occupation, even if it means building over traditional habitats. So, which is to the right of, you know, which right is to be protected, that of the contractor to pursue their lawful occupation, the builder, that is, or the developer, or the right of people living in traditional habitats to, uh, to maintain their, to live in their traditional habitats, perhaps maintain traditional ways of life. Another example is those, you know, of a, such a clash is between those, and these, this has actually happened frequently, as have the others. What about those who hold that war is destructive and violent and must be banned and prevented wherever possible? And those who hold that oppressed and colonized peoples have a right to wage war so as to achieve independence or national self-determination. The UN, as we saw earlier, recognizes a right to self-determination. A third of example of an irresoluble clash, yet another one, is that uh, justice requires that we all have an equal opportunity to develop our talents. And therefore, taxation for public health care and public education is necessary to give all of us that opportunity so that we can exercise the right to develop our talents. But, hold on, wait a moment, shouldn't we all be free to incur only the obligations we want to incur? That would then imply that taxation should be abolished and we should be free to choose schools and doctors and occupations and whether or not and how much to pay for other people to benefit from the same kinds of things that we do. In India, for example, a very familiar complaint is that affirmative action quotas, called reservations in India, as I'm sure you know, the affirmative action quotas in India often claim to disadvantage those who've achieved the target grades for admission to publicly funded universities and colleges or public sector employment. Now, in this kind of case, the right to have structural disadvantage recognized is set against the right to be rewarded for achievement. We shouldn't be surprised that the supposed arguments degenerate so quickly into um, 
bitterly entrenched positions and mutual hatred, if not worse. They were never uh, arguments in the first place, they were only assertions of purported rights. Liberalism, as we saw last time, has no conceptual resources with which to resolve these kinds of difficulties. They are, they are simply impasses or contradictions or, in a fashionable term, in the humanities, aporias. What about the actual empirical results of liberalism? Biener, for example, Ronald Biener has been severely critical of these. Instead of uh, the principle of choice, which according to liberalism we, we have a right to, instead of that all we see is, a, as he says, a shopping mall culture where vast numbers of shops all sell the same junk. Much of that may, much of the junk may also be built or manufactured to fail after a given time. So we have to uh, go back and buy the newest version, irrespective of the often unrecyclable rubbish that such a practice generates and creates. Well, the upshot then is that reasoned criticism, reasoned analysis, reasoned evaluation of our ways of life becomes impossible. It cannot be done within liberalism. Now that's very serious when our entire way of life gives cause for concern, or much of it does. Bina himself says, he poses the question like this, he says, why should we respect a way of life that is, I quote, servile, conformist and unreflective? We might add, or even worse than that, what would it even mean to respect such a way of life? The point I'm recapitulating here is, that the dead ends and incoherences have a deeper source in liberalism, and that is uh, the conception of uh, liberalism's conception of the human being as a radical chooser and nothing else. To be human is to be a chooser. Now, this is a substantive theory of human nature. It is a philosophical anthropology, and it is a philosophical anthropology of precisely the kind that liberalism requires us to refrain from adopting. And in addition, it means that we can't investigate the substance of ways of life. We can't investigate how we've come to need liberation from, say, feudality or inherited privilege or arbitrary power. Yes, liberalism historically has delivered us from such captivity, and that's a great, a mighty achievement. But it has only delivered us into another sort of captivity, and that is the captivity of these sterile and irresoluble oppositions between competing rights. That also means that under liberalism we cannot address, precisely because individual rights are the core of or at the core of liberalism, or at the center of it, means we can't address the combination we see all around us, that is, that of private perfection and public squalor or emptiness. Because liberalism cannot accommodate the idea of shared predicaments, unless those are simply chance developments. At that point, liberalism can only fall silent. Now, part of the problem, as I've already indicated, is that by accepting choice as the essence of personhood, liberalism rules out any substantive inquiry into the content and context of the choices we make. Have we been brainwashed, coerced, bullied? Have we been lied to? Are we making genuine, reasoned, informed choices and decisions? That can't be investigated within liberalism because it requires invest the investigation of substantive ways of life. And it requires that we look at the often unintended impacts of certain kinds of actions. It requires that we ask in what ways the rights we insist upon themselves create these kinds of problems. Well, Biener and many of the other contemporary Republicans excoriate the uniformity under which we live but liberalism would make it impossible to investigate the commercial pressures which create that kind of uniformity, which, you know, that kind of uniformity results from market pressures. 
Advertising, for example, is very often the sale of lifestyle rather than substance. It has a lot to do with this. The larger corporations know this. They have colossal advertising budgets and they mount fierce and often coordinated campaigns against, for example, attempts by states to restrict alcohol and tobacco advertising. Uh, this, um, well, tobacco advertising has been banned in a number of countries, actually banned, and um, a number of countries, I think certain Scandinavian countries and now Scotland, have minimum alcohol pricing. In other words, the choice is still available to people to consume tobacco and alcohol, but it is severely discouraged by state policy. Now, even within particular markets, commercial pressures have a no less insidious effect. We might need a free and diverse media for in liberal societies, but commercial pressures mean that, and this is well documented, that um, media outlets consistently are under commercial pressure to cut staff. And they become more and more dependent on official and corporate press releases, as we've seen. Now, the result is that we end up less and less well informed about the major issues facing us, and often simply unaware of major issues which the mass media choose not to mention at all for whatever reasons. They may be commercial, they may not. We don't know. And as a result, contemporary Republicans have attempted to identify constructive responses which enable us to simply to circumvent the sterility of liberalism. Well, many of them referred, have referred back to Aristotle, the great, great Greek philosopher, 384 to 322 BCE. And for Aristotle, we are speakers of language. We are therefore reasoning beings, and that's what makes us Zoa politica. What does that mean? It means that, yes, we live and start with the fact of disagreement. And, well, that means asking what these disagreements are about. Uh, abortion is almost a canonical example. The sterile positions for and against it in a rights discourse exclude, those sterile positions exclude the circumstances in which conception occurred. You know, was the conception a, mat a result of forced sex, such as coerced or coercion or rape? Was it the result of less obvious forms of coercion, such as an absence of sex education for people of all ages, including children and young people? That's done in a great many countries in the global north. What about this. Do people have access to good contraceptive advice and services? Do they conceive as a result of patriarchal cultures in which women are expected to conceive until they have a male child and so on? Now investigating all those issues requires learning about the world we live in and it means being prepared to, to reason our way towards a faculty of practical wisdom. Aristotle calls this phronesis, a faculty of practical wisdom or practical judgment. That means engaging with the public issues we face, learning about them, and learning from and participating in public discourse or public discourses on the kinds of issues we face. Citizenship is therefore an activity and not just a status. In, in the Aristotelian sense, it, um, it also relieves us of the burden of being saints, of being perfect people who always do good things and behave well all the time. It means recognizing weakness and its impact. It means being, wherever we can, honest about weakness and temptation and our susceptibility. And it means that there's no fixed boundary for the public space. We've seen how greatly our sense of the political has expanded, even in relatively recent times. Feminism has certainly done that for us. It's a priceless contribution feminism has made to our sense not only of ourselves but therefore to our sense of the political. Similarly, the way we treat the natural environment has become part of our political space. It is, it had better be, it is a matter now of our survival in a, the relatively short term. And in addition, we'll be familiar with the ways in which Marx, for example, is just one figure in showing us the extent of structural disadvantage and discrimination in all democratic societies, however democratic they might look. 
But in what, what is the nature of the space? What is the space in which we, we engage in this kind of reasoning activity? It is the space of politics. For Aristotle, politics is the supreme human activity, the architectonic activity. It is what integrates and makes sense of our roles, of our other roles in society, and enables us to identify what it is to be fully human. Well, we might and we should wonder what this has to do with the politics we see around us all the time. We see corruption, unscrupulous conduct, violence, mass slaughter, lying, brutality everywhere. If that's the world of politics, is that what Aristotle means? No. Aristotle and his inheritors mean something vastly different. What they recognize and, and advise us, show us we need to recognize, is that we need to pay far more attention to what is happening in the political space, including our systems of state, our legal and judicial processes, and so on at every level. We would need, of course, to transform our public institutions and our laws and systems of state very greatly. Can this be done? Well, there are powerful forces against it. We're going to look at the idea of illiberal democracy to start with. This uh, term seems to have been coined by Farid Zakaria in 1997 in an article Zakaria wrote for the journal Foreign Affairs. He uh, identifies a problem which we've noted above, and that is that it is not enough for liberal political systems to stop by institutionalizing or stop with the institutionalization of certain values and certain types of political organization. Okay, among these are free and fair elections, the separation of powers between elected assemblies, the ex you know, that is the executive branch of government, um, the judiciary, and the, and the legislature. It's not enough just to have the separation of powers. The point is that Zakaria and many others have pointed out that many of the uh, essential features of such systems, such as freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of property even, need to be protected. Liberalism requires the protection of all those. Now, Zakaria, Farid Zakaria calls this, this second set of protections constitutional liberalism. He cites Philippe Schmitter as saying that such constitutional liberalism has never been unambiguously li linked with the practice of democracy. In other words, we haven't often had those kinds of protections. Now, Zakaria was writing in the mid to late 90s at, at a time when any number of dictatorships around the world were being replaced by democracies. And he concludes that most, if not all, of the emerging democracies are procedurally democratic, but they in fact have, I quote, strong executives, weak legislatures, and weak judiciaries, and few civil and economic liberties. For Zakaria, it is not acceptable to claim that such forms of executive power are sometimes described as necessary for the elimination of rigid social stratification or of powerful established interests such as institutionalized religions or landed or corporate wealth. In many developing countries and increasingly in the developed world as we know, that kind of wealth is tightly concentrated in corporate or family hands. Now, there are other sets of conditions under which we live. We now live in a world permeated by permanent and apparently limitless electronic surveillance by virtually every state in the world. And moreover, this is a world in which open expressions of racial and religious hatred are once again part and parcel, or so it seems, of life in Western and many other democracies. In that kind of world, Zakaria's distinction between constitutional liberalism and democracy may well look looked much less convincing than it might have looked in the late 1990s. We uh, also need to remember that much of the uh, repressive legislation involved has been passed almost unquestioned by impeccably elected legislatures. There are examples, plenty of them. The, the US Homeland Security Act and the Patriot Act were both later criticized for unconstitutional provisions. 
Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, the Obama administration allowed some of the time limited or sunlet, sunset clauses in, that, in those pieces of legislation to lapse quietly. They didn't repeal them openly, they just let them lapse. Similarly, in the United Kingdom, the regulation of investigatory powers 2000 gave a large number of public bodies at different levels almost unlimited powers of electronic surveillance. The British Parliament passed a further law, the Investigatory Powers Act in 2016. More recently, the British government has started to require that publicly funded schools decide and record the ethnic backgrounds of their pupils. That was a procedure which used to be carried out by state officials in the now abolished apartheid South Africa. In the UK, the data collection has been outsourced to a private firm. And if parents don't disclose a child's ethnic background, the schools have been told, I quote, to guess the background. That comes from a paper by Pels, P-E-L-L-S, 2016. Uh, I'm not sure if that practice has since been abandoned, but uh, the practice of officials deciding people's ethnic background or racial background was a feature of apartheid South Africa as well. So today, Zakaria, Farid Zakaria, would have even more evidence of the spread of illiberal, illiberal democracy than he did at the time. Uh, that has, of course, been noted. Yasha Monk points out the ways in which several apparently stable democracies, including wealthy Western ones, have seen the rise of populist and often demagogic politicians. Uh, Monk cites Donald Trump, of course, who won the election and is a candidate, clearly a candidate for, for the next one this later this year. The French leader of the uh, Front National, the National Front, Brian Le Pen. The far-right Dutch politician, Geert Wilders. Geert Wilders are all cited as examples by Monk. By Monk. Monk also mentions the British referendum vote on the 23rd of June 2016 to leave the European Union. He is blunt about the political opportunism of those who use, for example, terrorist attacks or attempted coups to advance their own brands of xenophobic or ethno-nationalist politics. Monk specifically names Marine Le Pen's reaction to the mass killing in Nice by a man driving a stolen truck during the Bastille Day celebrations during the, on the city's promenade into, for the 14th of July 2016. He goes into detail over the Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's swift centralization of power after the failed coup that month, July 2016. Erdogan dismissed thousands of people, apparently not for anything they had done, but for what they might have thought, and included university professors, civil servants, all kinds of people. And that effectively put an end to a long-standing long -standing Turkish dispensation under which a secular or secularist elite had legislated to protect religious and ethnic minorities and a reasonable if varying variable amount of um, journalistic and academic criticism. Similar processes have, have been very obviously at work in Hungary and Poland as well and in those countries elected governments have swiftly undermined <coughs> the Constitutional Court, they stacked government institutions like the Electoral Commission with party loyalists and have turned the most important media outlets into uncritical propaganda machines. That's a quotation from Monk, from Monk rather. This is of course much more than just a matter of political climate. Yasha Monk rightly identifies the enormous democratic deficit in the European Union where three of the four major institutions, that is the Council of Ministers, the European Commission and the European Court of Justice, barely figure in the consciousness of over 520 million EU citizens, even though those bodies' decisions have an enormous impact throughout the EU, throughout the EU, that is the law in the EU. Monk is also equally right when he points out that the only elected EU institution, the European Parliament, is elected on tiny turnouts, so sometimes of 30% or, or less, and has, well, hardly any publicity in the rest of the European Union. I mean, that does vary across, across the EU anyway.
Well, the European Parliament also has few, if any, formal powers, but it does have powers that it, that it can use. So that's a slightly unfair comment on Maung's part. The European Parliament, under the Treaty of Maastricht, um, the European Parliament can, well, seize all draft EU law, which is drafted by the European Commission. That's the only drafting body in the EU. The European Parliament sees all this. That's the law under the Treaty of Maastricht, which created the EU, turned the EC into the EU. And the European Parliament can reject or amend any such draft before the draft goes to the actual lawmaking body, that is the Council of Ministers. This is called the co-decision procedure. Secondly, the European Parliament can dismiss all the European Commissioners. On the one occasion, it would almost certainly have done so over a substantial corruption scandal. The Commissioners resigned en bloc. Some were reappointed who uh, had not been involved, clearly not been involved in, in the corruption um, of which many of the others were accused, about 23 or 25 Commissioners. Furthermore, the debate on the EU's democratic deficit has actually been underway for a considerable time. Reforms have been proposed and there has been fierce public criticism of the EU's subordination to highly secretive and very powerful corporate bodies. For example, the European Parliament very rarely uses the co-decision procedure and instead allows almost all draft legislation through under the much less stringent consultation procedure. But Mauck nevertheless concludes that the problems faced by liberal democracy as it turns into illiberal democracy constitute only one half of the problem. The other half is what he calls the tendency of the elites in liberal democracies to see themselves as in effect having to protect liberal democracy against the worst populist movements and the worst populist motivations. Mounk calls this undemocratic liberalism and he says it is part of the cause of ordinary people's bitter sense of remoteness and alienation from their own apparently thoroughly democratic systems. As we saw in the chapter on liberalism, the elitist tendency and a profound fear and distrust of the public are inherent in liberal theory and in supposedly liberal democracies. Now, Monk says that historically, liberalism and democracy only came together coincidentally. That is, during the first three decades of the second, after the Second World War, when enormous inequalities were significantly reduced and hundreds of millions of people, especially in industrial countries, experienced previously unimaginable improvements in their lives, not just their standard of living, in their whole lives. But Mauck does not mention the role of the state or of mass trade union membership in bringing this about. Neither does he mention the impact of vastly expanded public provision in education and healthcare at every level in such countries. Um, in respect of healthcare, of course, the, uh, the exception is the United States, despite the more recent passage of the uh, Affordable Care Act by the Obama administration. But Mauck's explanation, however, relies on what he considers only a historical coincidence. And that is the, the improvement in material conditions and relations of production in industrial countries after the Second World War. That may be a Marxist or quasi-Marxist explanation. Zakaria, for his part, makes little or no mention of such material conditions as forming a decisive context for the uh, coincidence of liberal and liberalism and democracy. But like Mauck, he sees the collapse or imminent collapse, Zakaria sees the imminent collapse or of liberal democracy as alarming and very dangerous for the whole world. Given the alternatives on offer, some of which a lot of leaders may be about to impose on some of them on us too, given the alternatives on offer, their alarm and anxiety are entirely understandable. 
Monk, of course, was writing 20 years after Zakari, writing in 2015 or 16, very much in our own time. And he sees uh, an urgent need for us to restate and protect the ends of liberalism. But substantive ends are precisely the kinds of things that liberalism cannot allow itself to propound. We've seen that problem above in the chapter on liberalism and earlier, we've seen it earlier in the, the liberalism chapter and uh, also in, in this topic, uh, republicanism and citizenship. Now there's a further set of problems for our predicament as outlined by Zakaria and Monk, and they're certainly not the only two, I've just drawn from them because they're fairly clear and fairly direct. The further set of problems, and Zakaria and Monk both neglect the way hundreds of millions around the world have come to think they're faced by threats like permanent debt, unemployment or under, underemployment, and even the obliteration or overrunning of their own cultures. How is it that they've come to think that only some kind of powerful leader who promises to assert cultural, religious or ethnic or racial homogeneity can save them? Well, the single greatest so source of our knowledge, if knowledge is the right word, of the world is the largely corporate-owned mass media. That's been thoroughly documented around the world. But Zakaria and Monk, well, neither Zakaria nor Monk, Monk um, seems to pay much attention to the part played by the mass media in creating our current sense of our situation. Of course, there have been other, I mean, other people have written powerful and sharp analyses of the media's part in our sense of our problems, and many of those have been written by very experienced journalists. Herman and Chomsky, 1988, Edwards and Cromwell, 2006 and 2012, Dan Rather, famous journalist, 2011, McChesney and Nichols, 2005, Nichols and McChesney, 2013. There's plenty of work around this, as we work all over the world in almost all, even reasonably serious democracies. Uh, and yet, Z neither Zakaria nor Mauk seem to pay much attention to the media's part in creating our sense of our current situation. But all is not lost, and um, in spite of challenges and threats and other problems, including commercial issues, um, the mass media broadly, under the complementary term, comp under the umbrella term, beg your pardon, under the umbrella term, complementary media, have emerged mainly on the internet. I've written about this myself, other people have covered it as well in much greater detail than I have. Well, the point is that there have been reactions. And similarly, examples of public involvement often show that when ordinary people, almost irrespective of their background, have the chance to address public issues seriously, they can and frequently do engage openly and seriously with the issues before them to reach very sound decisions. In 2000, the Canadian province of British Columbia used a form of nearly random selection to create a 160-member citizens' assembly. That assembly considered several different electoral systems and then decided on a particular one to replace the existing simple majority or first-past-the-post system. The existing system had, twice in succession in provincial elections in British Columbia, the existing simple, uh, simple majority system had twice in successive elections produced anomalous results for the, in the elections for the uh, province's assembly. In 1996, the Liberal Party won the popular vote. They got 41.8% of the vote against the New Democrats, 305 But the Liberal Party lost the election because they won fewer seats. In 2000, four years later, the Liberals won 77 out of 79 assembly seats, but they only won 57.6% of the vote. In that election, the New Democrats won 21.6% of the vote, one-fifth, but they won only 2 out of 79 seats. The Green Party got 12.4% of the vote and won no seats at all. The result was a one-party assembly in a climate of declining public confidence in the former political process. The public were deeply disturbed about this. And in response, 
The incoming provincial government created this citizens' assembly. The assembly received funding and administrative support from the provincial government, from the civil servants who were delegated to assist and advise. The members had initial training at weekends and then they held over 50 public hearings all around the province. And they concluded with six more meetings. The assembly discussed several different electoral systems and then they recommended by a vote of 123 to 31 that the province changed to a proportional system based on the single transferable vote. The members chose criteria for an electoral system from a list of nine different systems and they decided, I beg your pardon, the members of the assembly chose criteria from a, for an electoral system from a list of nine and they decided that the main criteria were effective local representation, a fair proportional way of translating votes into seats, and maximum voter choice. Those were their main criteria for an electoral system. Crucially, all the evidence was that they made a reasoned and intelligible choice based on deepening knowledge of the subject. And they did this without collapsing into aggregates of opinion or vote banks. There's a lot of documentation on that. Now, there are other ways of getting citizens involved. In India, the state of Maharashtra is one where the central government's National Rural Health Mission, NRHM, has drawn upon local non-governmental organizations, NGOs, to help include citizens as monitors of the health mission. The mission itself was started in April 2005 as a response to a healthcare system, if the word system is at all applicable here, which was widely acknowledged to be a national disgrace, and that's widely said in public. The NRHM specifically mandates community monitoring, and it states that community monitoring cannot be implemented by state health department officials alone. It is largely the officials concerned who must be monitored, and that's in the NRHM. This involves a change in the balance of power between ordinary people and the officials. The plan explicitly intends, the community monitoring plan explicitly intends that ordinary people have an authoritative voice in evaluating the mission and in influencing decisions. It's actually in the National Health Mission document 2013. Now there's a Pune-based NGO called Sathi which notes that community-based monitoring or CBM generates popular pressure on officials to maintain the quality of services and it independently generates information about the functioning of health services that the standard management systems almost always miss. These include things like whether or not doctors actually turn up, whether or not nursing staff make the outreach visits they're supposed to make. It also includes the way staff behave towards patients. It includes prescription practices. It covers corruption and denial of care or orders to patients to go to private providers. And it covers illegal charges demanded by staff from patients. I've got that from the uh, CBM report 2012 and a report by a researcher called Kakade 2010. These are all public documents. They're on the net. Now it is, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that when um, CBM, Community Based Monitoring, was started, uh, ideas of what it, sh what it would involve varied very greatly. Even NGOs saw the task as data generation and form filling. The villagers insisted on having more open-ended questions so that they could state their perceptions of the way the NRHM was being implemented. Well, the creation of a newsletter across the districts together with media coverage of the public hearings or Johnson Wise, literally people's hearings, well that may have helped here. That may have helped the villagers to get more information and insist that they have a say in the kinds of questions that were asked about the workings of the system. 
Now, the very fact of public hearings at a range of levels, from primary health care, PHC, to district level, was crucial. It revealed some embarrassing failures in the way the NRHM worked. And it exposed other gaps in the system. But significant res improvements resulted. And they seem to have resulted without the creation of the grossly excessive, burdensome and destructive monitoring systems which are inevitable in managerialist regimes. It may be equally significant that the NRHM requires the lowest tier of government in India's constitution, the village panchayats, to be involved in the monitoring process. Now, as time went by, the citizens started to participate in planning the services. And officials' dismay, even shock, at the very idea of such involvement started to fade. It is also crucial that the quality of citizen involvement improved as citizens came to know more about the official systems and powers and about the funding systems involved. That's in the Kakade report as well. Even many of the doctors in the NRHM had no idea about such matters which, as the citizens identified. And similar benefits from citizen involvement have been noted in, for example, a citizen journalism initiative called Iyindaba Ziafrika, which was conducted jointly by the South African newspaper Grokot's Mail and the Rhodes University School of Journalism and Media at Grahamstown in Natal. That project was time limited as funding was provided only for a set period, but similar benefits of from citizen involvement were noted in that particular project. And one implication is that citizenship as informed engagement is inherently egalitarian, as we're all reasoning beings and therefore equal in respect of that capacity or faculty. A further implication is that inequalities and the processes which generate and maintain them would need to be publicly justified. The public to whom those inequalities would have to be justified would inevitably include victims of the relevant processes and structures and inequalities. This egalitarian character of the idea of citizenship as informed engagement, this egalitarian feature of it amounts to a I should say egalitarian character of it, amounts to a development in republican thought since Aristotle. Aristotle is often criticized for accepting the exclusion of women and slaves from citizenship and for uh, holding that only those who can afford the time, that is those who have the wealth and leisure, to reflect on public matters are entitled to be citizens. I draw that point, I summarized it from a paper by by Mulgan, written in 2000. Now, Aristotle does seem to recognize that this would exclude, he, he does recognize that this would exclude large numbers of men who have to make their living through labor or trade and commerce, but who would otherwise be fit for citizenship. Mulgan makes that point too. Aristotle does also say that domestic equality is the closest private approximation to public justice. Today, we would probably not accept either of those exclusions of women or of large numbers of men who haven't the wealth or leisure to be to reflect on public affairs, we would probably rightly reject both of those, con those um, features. And today's Republican theorists rightly, rightly regard gender equality as an inherent element in citizenship. Indeed, citizenship would, well, would be unintelligible without it. And it would be unintelligible without the element of universal entitlement to citizen membership that characterizes all democracies today, despite efforts by some of them to restrict entitlement to citizenship to those who are already, no doubt, almost certainly lawfully resident. Now this, hap this has happened in more countries than one, by the way. Now, this also means that we don't 
need to concern ourselves excessively with whether or not Aristotle is a recognizable social democrat or a liberal by today's standards or a conservative supporter of the established order. That issue has been debated by Aristotle scholars such as Richard Mulgan and Martha Nussbaum. Martha Nussbaum. But it is not um, directly pertinent to our concerns here. What we need to do instead is to see where Aristotle's recognition that we are reasoning beings and therefore zoa politica takes us. It certainly takes us far beyond Aristotle's historically contingent limitation of the entitlement to citizenship. The point here is that severe inequalities, including structural and systemic inequalities, would almost certainly undermine any wide sense of citizenship in which I've outlined it here. Severe structural and systemic inequalities would render, would make it unintelligible and perhaps impossible to think of any sense of shared predicaments in very unequal societies. That's often very obvious. Elites often buy themselves out of the effects of grossly dysfunctional public processes and public institutions. Well, as we've seen with the ecologism topic, the elites probably can't buy themselves indefinitely out of the diseases and dangers caused by water or air pollution, and they cannot indefinitely buy themselves locations away from sites of things like radioactive contamination. They can't do it indefinitely. And as for distributional or material equality, this can't be separated from, cannot be separated from wider questions of the mode of production. But there is no justification for removing that kind of issue from serious and open examination by citizens. Any serious discourse on such a topic would furthermore need to abandon the current promises or assumptions of ever-increasing wealth and ever-increasing consumption. We saw that with the ecologism topic anyway. Well, what such a field of discourse could well do, on the other hand, is to initiate serious examination of what we produce and how we produce it, and of what we consume and how we consume it. Under liberalism, these would be matters of private preference, and the state would be seen as a permanently alien and potentially hostile institution. But under the idea of republicanism, such matters, air pollution, water pollution, severe structural and material in other material inequalities, <coughs> become matters of public concern and decision. That in turn means the boundary between the public and the private is itself to be decided by reasoned public consideration. Now, I'll pause there with the remark, I'll stop there with the remark that under Republican thought, anything in human life is potentially a matter for public deliberation, reasoned and informed public consideration. We'll come back to this next time. We'll stop there. We'll come back to this next time and uh, probably conclude our topic of republicanism and citizenship next time round.